Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we are going to be looking at our first trust problem on this channel. So before we hop into the problem, I wanted to just specify that this is going to be a method of joints problem. But since it's the first video, we need to actually explain what a truss is in the first place. So what am I looking at here? This is just a truss. A truss is an assembly of members joined at the endpoints to form a framework. So here you can see member AB and member BC are joined together by this pin. And right here at the other pin, which is actually different from this pin, we will explain that later, do not worry. There is another connection that has three members intersecting at that one point. Similarly with the roller and this other pin at the top here with two members connecting each other. Okay. So typically we have roof trusses and bridge trusses, which I'm sure you've seen before. I don't need to go into too much detail about it, but understanding, you know, that these are used as structural framework to transmit loads from one place to another uh, is fundamental to understanding why we're actually solving these problems in the first place. So when we're solving these problems, what do we need to know? We need to know that all loads are applied at joints. Oh, little typo there. Joints. What does that mean? We have a load here at this joint, two loads here at this joint, and our reactions will be at these supports. But why? Why are they there in the first place? Well, if you think about, let's say, a bridge, let's take a look at the span of a bridge quickly. And we had a truss that looks like this. You can imagine that underneath this platform, we're going to have supporting beams running underneath this bridge deck, right? And if we have a weight crossing across this bridge, such, such as like a car, then first the load will be transferred to these members. And then this member will transmit the load to where each of these joints are. So I hope that kind of makes sense. And the second point that we need to understand as well is that members are joined at pins. And now these are both assumptions that we make, but this assumption here is just to ensure that the center lines are concurrent in these problems. So we don't have issues with, you know, one member lining up in a different spot compared to another, creating headaches with moment and things like that. So it just helps to simplify things. And this also means that no moment reactions are created in general for these problems. Uh, so that's one thing you don't really have to worry about, right? And it makes sense because we don't want these members to be uh, kind of subject to any moment at all uh, if we can avoid it. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with members that look something like this. We have two joints at the end here with loads applied at the joints. And we have the pins there once, once again, like we said. And if we are pulling this member in this direction, we are understanding that we're creating a tension on this member, right? This member is going to be elongated if it wasn't rigid. Uh, for us, we'll be dealing with rigid, but you can assume that these tension uh, forces will be creating elongation. But if we went in the opposite direction, like this, we would actually be creating a compressive force, shortening this member. Another cool thing about this is we also remember, if you watch my previous videos, uh, shameless plug, sorry, but you would realize that this is actually a two force member. Now, if you don't remember what that is, you can look at the top of the screen, or I can just explain it here. A two force member is pretty much where the forces are acting in equal magnitude, opposite direction, and along the same line of action. So that's all you need to know for these problems. Uh, so to solve by method of joints, what are we actually looking for? Why are we solving this truss? Well, just like any other equilibrium problem with rigid bodies, we're trying to find the force in each member to bring the structure to equilibrium. And it's very detrimental to understand that so that we can actually keep a safe structural uh, framework. 
So let's get into the second part of this, uh, you know, explanation and actually show what we're going to do to solve this problem. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this problem. I just want to let you guys know that I missed this 200 Newton force a bit earlier when I was doing that first part. So uh, just remember to add that to our problem here. Uh, so the question goes, determine the force in each member of the truss and state if the members are in tension or compression. So the cool thing about this problem is that this pin and this roller here are irrelevant to our problem kind of because it's not really requiring it. We may need to solve for it at some point, but it's not a main priority to actually uh, go out and try and solve for it. Uh, so what we're looking for is, you know, a step-by-step -step process on how to solve problems like this. So generally with methods of joints, we're going to be looking for free body diagrams at these joints. And we're looking for joints with forces applied to it, where there may be one or two unknowns. Okay. That's going to be the easiest place for us to start. Next, we're going to apply our equilibrium equations from before. Uh, and the interesting about the interesting thing about this problem is that we can actually use the same conventions that we've been using from before. So if we had summation of fx, we could say that positive will be this way, and the force is at y. We could say up is positive, and we could follow that same convention. We're not going to need moment for this problem, but you may need them in the future. You never know. So, what's the last thing? Solve joints for all unknowns. So let's hop into the problem and see what we can actually do here. So joint D, let's draw the free body diagram like it's asking us to do. We have the forces in our members, right? FDA is gonna be there. And FDC is gonna be there, right? And this is just uh, the way I'm drawing the forces. But why did I draw them in this direction? Because I'm assuming that these are going to be the reactions produced based on the loading at these joints. Now it may actually be different from what we're actually writing, but you know, just go with your gut, whatever you think is going to be the right, uh, right way or orientation of the force, then go for it because you don't want to be redrawing and, you know, getting confused with signs later on. It's just going to save us a headache, right? So that's joint D. The first thing we'll do is solve for the X component, which is FDC. So we take our equilibrium equations, summation of forces at X is equal to zero. And we have 400 Newtons, which is positive. And then we have negative FDC. Solving that, FDC is going to equal 400 Newtons. But we're not done here, because we need to know if this force is representing this member in tension or compression. Well, the general rule of thumb or convention for problems like this is when you have tension, it should pull the joint. And when you have compression, it should push the joint. So let's take a look at what we have up top here. You can see that FDC based on the member's location and the way we draw on it is actually pushing at that joint. So we're actually gonna have a compressive force in that member. And then similarly, we can solve for FDA, uh, but it's gonna be a very similar process where we take summation of forces at Y, and we solve pretty much the same way. We're going to take 300 negative because it's going downwards. And then we have plus FDA. And FDA is going to be 300 newtons. Once again, it's in compression because it's pushing at that joint. So there's two of our answers already. Two members solve for. Now we can move on to our next joint and similarly solve it uh, the same way. Okay, so now I have the next joint set up. While I'm solving this one, since it's very similar to the one before, I'm just going to explain what is actually happening uh, when we're solving this and what it actually means. You know, the convention can come off as kind of confusing at times. Uh, so I just want to explain one last time before we move on that, you know, at these pins, we're looking for the reaction at the pin. No, it's notated as what the force of the member is going to be but we're really looking for what reaction is being created based on the forces at that location, right? Very similar to what we do with a normal pin, which has two components being produced. But the thing is with this pin, the forces that are being produced are actually being transferred from this member into the next member, which is actually pretty unique uh, and a cool thing about it. Um, so the convention may seem kind of opposite of your intuition, right? Because let's say FBC here is drawn as, you know, something that looks like it would compress this member. 
but this is actually going to be just the reaction that's produced at the pin. So the force in the member is actually going to be tensile, while this is the reaction that that force is producing. So I hope that kind of makes a little bit more sense on where that convention is coming from and the difference between this pin and the support pin. Uh, now, back to the actual problem solving. I have found FBA to be 250 newtons. And based on the convention we have decided previously, we are pulling away from that joint. So we're going to have con uh, tension here. Now we can solve for Fy. And it's pretty much the same thing as we've done before. We have 200 newtons going down low. And then we have FBC going up. FBC is going to equal 200 newtons. Not surprising. And it's going to be in tension as well. Now the last part of the problem, we're going to need to solve for member AC's force component. All right, finally, we're solving for joint C to get that FCA member force. And we have all of our unknowns solved for previously. And we know which ones are compressive and which one are tensile. So we drew them relative uh, to our conventions that we solve for and the conventions that we're following, right? Pull joint, push joint, based on tension and compression, uh, respectively. So how can we get FCA? Well, we know that we're looking for the Y component of this force. So this angle is going to play uh, a bit of a role getting those components. And we also have RCX here, which is unknown. But if we actually solve for a summation of forces at Y, we won't even need to consider this RCX component and kind of avoid it altogether. So what do we have? We have negative 200 newtons, still following this FY convention above. And then we have a positive FCA times what? It's going to be sine this component here, this theta. So what is this theta going to be? It's going to be 45 degrees up here. Why did I put that there? Because tan inverse of 2 over 2 is going to give you 45. Nice little trigonometry review lesson right there for you. So solving FCA is going to leave us with a fun number 282.84 newtons. You bring this over, the negatives cancel out, and we are left with a positive sign, meaning that our convention we drew is correct. Also meaning that it's pushing the joint, meaning it is a compressive member force. All right, so those are your final answers. Sorry, it's a long video, but I just wanted to really kind of get into the details of what confuses people about these problems and, you know, really explain a step-by-step -step process on how to solve it, okay? So I hope this helps.